Hi everybody, my name is Steve Miller, and I had one job to do, and that was to press record at the beginning of the webinar. Well, I didn't do such a great job. I hit record late, so I missed some introductions, and I missed the very first question. In case you don't know, we have three presenters in this webinar. Uh, there are Greg Conley, who's the president of the American Vaping Association, Dr. Tim McCulley, and Dr. Michael Siegel. Both of these guys are e-cigarette researchers. So I apologize for that. That's on me, without a doubt. And so I missed the very first question. And the first question that was asked, and it was to Greg Conley, was what does the FDA deeming and regs moving into the OMB mean in plain terms? So we're going to pick it up with Greg's response to that question. It means great danger for the future of the e-cigarette industry. Um, the FDA's deeming regulation, which was put out to the public about 18 months ago and then was opened for public comment, that regulation would impose such strict terms on the e-cigarette industry that we could very easily see 99.9% .9 plus of the 100,000 plus vapor products available on the market today end up banned. Wow. Uh, the, long, the long story short of that is that they want to require what's known as retroactive pre-market review. And in English, that means that they want for every single nicotine vapor product on the market, a potentially two to $10 million, maybe even more expensive for e-liquid products, a two to $10 million application just to have a chance of being able to stay on the market. So that regulation has moved to the Office of Management and Budget at the White House. We do not know if the FDA has changed it. Now is a great time for e-cigarette companies to take meetings with the OMB to discuss the dangers of uh, that. And it also um, reflects the need for a bill called HR 2058 in the House to pass. Great. Well, thank you for that information, Greg. And we know we've been talking about the FDA deeming regulations for some time now, but it seems like they're finally coming to fruition here. Um, moving on to the next question, you were almost weren't able to attend today because of a city council meeting in Philadelphia. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. Uh, Philadelphia last year um, banned vaping everywhere that smoking is banned. Then they shortly thereafter closed off a uh, loophole that would have allowed bars um, to get permission to allow vaping or smoking in their establishments. The next step in their uh, renewed war on tobacco and non-tobacco e-cigarettes is to ban the sale of vapor products and tobacco in pharmacies or any store with a pharmacy. Wow. That seems to be the, the enriched CVS bill of 2015. The CVS chose to uh, not sell tobacco products and appears now they're lobbying to make sure their competitors can't do it either. Uh, the good news though is that that hearing that was supposed to be today was canceled so at least it would appear that maybe one or two or three members of the council uh, started to push back against this ridiculous proposal. <laughs> and do you know if any other cities are have, or have similar legislation pending? Um, pending, I don't know. I know many cities have passed these sorts of laws. I think San Francisco has one. Uh, Dr. Siegel would know, but Boston may have passed something similar to that. I may be wrong. Uh, but it's, it's a uh, completely ineffectual policy that just leads somebody to go down to the gas station rather than the CVS to get cigarettes. Um, but it's, that's the kind of thing tobacco control likes. Well, we all have heard about the um, public health report out of England, which is supporting that smokers switching to e-cigarettes. Um, they're saying that switching to e-cigarettes is actually a healthier alternative than smoking traditional tobacco. And do you see this having a positive impact on the fight here in the U.S. for e-cigarettes? Yes, um, there are great positives to that report. There, um, we have been slowly accumulating the great deal of scientific evidence that we now have. Public Health England's report, as well as the letter that was co-signed by 12 different public health orgs in the UK, including Cancer Research UK, Action on Smoking and Health, and the Royal College of Physicians. Um, that is going to be helpful in getting legislators to recognize that, okay, so the American lung, cancer, heart, they're all aligned against these cigarettes and won't say one positive thing about them. But over in England, perhaps the second best 
healthcare system in the world, and they probably argue over in England that they're the number one and we're the number two. Um, <laughs> that they're taking a common sense approach to this. So we've already started to see that this is having an impact. Unfortunately, we can expect, uh, just as we've seen in the past year, where seemingly every week a journal is publishing new junk about e-cigarettes, um, it's going to still be tough because it's gonna be the Public Health England report and maybe the one positive journal article that comes out every month versus four to eight to 10, maybe even more than 10 uh, negative articles that are going to be coming out. Jeez. Well, recently you were testifying in front of the uh, Indiana State Legislator, and in your testimony, you were discussing the Public Health England report, um, and they seem to be fixated on the fact that it wasn't a USA-based report. Now, are you finding that opponents dismiss this report because it's not USA-based? Uh, not typically. That was fairly new to me, this idea that it's not created in the United States, therefore it can't be taken seriously. I mean, this person that was bringing that up, I believe, is a, a liberal Democrat. And a lot of the climate change uh, data that we have, a lot of the studies are coming from overseas. So perhaps um, in that area, he's okay with foreign research. Uh, but that's mostly just a cop out from somebody that even if you put 100 US studies in front of him, he wasn't gonna change his mind. Yeah, his opinion is fixated. <laughs> yes. Um, so you're on the front line of the e-cigarette fight while traveling around the country and advocating for people's rights. Um, is there one myth or fallacy that you encounter that bothers you more than any others? Hmm. Um, it would probably just be the flavor argument because when I quit, or rather when I tried to quit smoking with an e-cigarette in 2009, all I had access to were these little Chinese cigalikes that were only available in tobacco and menthol. Uh, those flavors just reminded me of how great a cigarette would taste. So <laughs> by the by, I got the product in October and uh, dual used for a month or two and then quickly relapsed back to smoking. And it wasn't until August 2010 when I had a watermelon flavored vapor product that I was actually able to quit. And so to go to these hearings and to just hear these people uh, throw out with no care or regard recklessly that well, they come in flavors just to appeal to children. These are companies target marketing to children. And sometimes I'll confront those people in the hallway and say, well, I'm standing next to a business owner who lives 10 minutes away from you. And this business owner has 100 flavors in their store. And are you, will you tell this person straight to their face, you're marketing to children? And very quickly, they disengage from the conversation because it's a lot easier to just go forward with hype and conjecture when speaking generally than it is to actually look somebody in the eyes and say, you're marketing to children. It's a fallacy. Well, great. Thank you for that, Greg. Uh, post deeming regulations, what are some of the avenues for advocacy that vapors can take? Well, now is the time um, for vapors to go to casa.org, C-A-S-A-A.org, and go to the call to action page for HR 2058, which is a bill in Congress that would force the FDA to regulate all vapor products on the market, rather than just take the easy route of banning 99.9% .9 of them. We need to add co-sponsors to that bill. Uh, our best chance for co-sponsors are Republicans. So if you have a Republican representing you in the US House, uh, take the extra step, make a phone call, go to your local vape stores, try and get them educated because they're the best people to actually have a physical meeting with the congressman or his staff to talk about how jobs will be lost in his, his or her district if this bill is not passed. Great. Thank you for that, Greg. Uh, we're going to open up the Q&A session now to some of the attendee questions. Um, so we got another one here that kind of uh, is on the same topic we were just talking about. Is there any other avenues for vaping advocates that uh, once the deeming regulations come out, they can continue the fight for e-cigs? Uh, if HR 2058 is not passed in the budget deal at the end of the year, 2058, the bill will remain alive throughout 2016. Um, and if you haven't read the deeming reg, uh, which uh, I don't blame you for, there is a two-year implementation window from the date that the FDA uh, finalizes the regulation to the date that the deeming ban begins. And so 
during that two years, we still need to be pushing for the passage of HR 2058. Uh, without that bill, um, our advocacy efforts won't mean much. Uh, but regardless, at the state level, this industry is still going to be under attack because even if the FDA releases their final regulation, the people that want to destroy this industry will still be able to say, oh, well, it's two years from now. God knows what could happen in the next two years. We need to take action now. Uh, <laughs> So we need to get the more vendor groups formed in states. We need consumers to uh, make sure that they vote in the November election and that their, uh, their elected officials know that their, future, their vote is influenced by how they voted in the past on vapor and that their future votes will be influenced by how they vote on uh, vapor issues. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, that great description there, Greg. Uh, we got another question here. Can you describe the work that the AVA does and how do you differ from the other advocacy groups? Sure. Essentially, AVA is not a trade group. I work a lot uh, with Safada. I'm a huge fan of theirs as a trade organization. I have helped set up chapters in different states for them and help them uh, train and advise their lobbyists day to day when they're facing threats. Um, so we do not represent the industry, nor do we really represent consumers. That's CASA's job. ABA is the media mouthpiece for policies, promoting policies that encourage the growth of small businesses in this industry, not because we represent them, but because as a public health advocate, I believe that the best path forward for helping more and more smokers quit is for innovation to happen, and innovation happens under small businesses. So ABA, we put out uh, press releases um, that get picked up oftentimes by large newspapers, large websites, about new studies on e-cigarettes, the consequences of taxes, usage bans, um, research that has been uh, dishonest. Um, we often use Dr. Michael Siegel Dr. Farsalinos, uh, other people like that as primary sources. And then part of my job is flying around the country, meeting with vendors, meeting with vapors, educating them on issues. Uh, I was just in Washington, D.C. yesterday where I gave a presentation at the Food, Drug, and Law Institute Conference mm -hmm. on Tobacco about e-cigarettes in a post-steaming world, uh, hoping to do more of those type of conferences outside the e-cig world. But essentially, uh, I'm on the front lines, and one of the nice benefits of not representing the industry is that whereas uh, Safada um, rightfully has to be nice in most of their communications, I can, like Dr. Siegel, uh, be a little more hard-edged when appropriate and when people are really uh, lying and harming public health. <laughs> Great. And we, we certainly appreciate the stern advocacy uh, for the e-cig industry. We have another question here, and it kind of relates back to the uh, public health report out of England and it, it being an, an England report. Is there any reason to discredit the England-based report uh, solely on the fact that it was produced in another country? No, no. Um, if it was, there, I could see, I could see people in third world countries perhaps saying that science uh, is not valid. I don't know if I would uh, understand that, but when it comes to England, where it's the first or second best healthcare system in the world with some of the most premier academics in the world, it simply doesn't make sense to discredit the report based off of that. Uh, there have been other attempts to discredit the report. There's a part of me that wishes that they had not said 95% less hazardous than smoking and just instead just said far, far less hazardous than smoking, so then we wouldn't have had this war between academics about whether or not that figure was appropriate. Um, but no, long story short, there's absolutely no reason uh, to discredit a report simply because of the country of origin. Huh. Yeah, and it kind of started a debate about percentage points and not the actual evidence that was included in the report. Yes, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, Dr. Michael Erickson, who is an FDA grantee, runs um, School of Public Health in Georgia, and that was one of his contentions. Uh, I think we may disagree. I think he may have, uh, he may think that 95% is too low, whereas I think 95% is, is too high. Um, so, or rather, I think it's more 96, 97, 98 
and he might think it's lower than 95. Uh, but regardless, the debate may have been a little differently coming out of that report if um, it just made clear, look, these, are, these aren't safe, but they are far, far, far less hazardous. <laughs> exactly. Well, Greg, I definitely appreciate the information you've given us here. It's been very informative. Uh, before we move on to the next panelist, we'd like to see if any of the other panelists want to comment on the questions that were asked previously. All right. Well, I think we're good. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on. Uh, our next speaker is an expert in air quality and human health exposure and risk assessment. In addition, he is a multi-award winning environmental expert and world-renowned environmental leader and the chief executive manager of change, um, Dr. Timothy McCauley. Dr. McCauley, thank you for joining us today. Sure. Thank you. So, Dr. McCauley, you are an expert in air quality and human health exposure and risk, and you have done extensive work in secondhand vapor exposure, uh, especially with how it compares to tobacco smoke. So, how does e-cig vapor compare to the secondhand smoke of traditional tobacco? Um, in general, vapor is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in general, vapor has a substantially less uh, amount of particulate that's generated because vapor is actually uh, not, a, it's not a combustion process. Uh, so you're actually producing or you're actually producing a vapor that quickly volatilizes um, and, uh, you know, and therefore you know, has a rapid dissipation where something that's more of a combustion-based product can tend to exist longer, generate other types of particulates uh, that can actually pose secondary exposures such as PM2.5 and things that you don't see in the electronic cigarette vapor. Oh, great. Well, thank you for that explanation there. Um, do you believe that e-cigarettes pose any risk to public health in terms of secondhand vapor? Well, I'm not going to say that they don't pose any risk. Um, as Greg, Greg mentioned, that from the research that I've done and been involved with, with various panels from the uh, American Heart Association, with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, um, and the research that we've looked at in my discussions with John Samet, uh, who is a global health leader in his own right, uh, you know, the, again, the, I think the jury is still out. Um, the big question is, what's the research doing now to show what those levels are? Um, I do agree that at this point in time, it's very difficult to put percentages on what we feel is safe versus unsafe. Um, the main question that always stems from is the current policy of EPA with nicotine to say that there is no safe level. Uh, from the research that I've been involved in, uh, we've effectively demonstrated that, you know, um, although it's been a few years since we've done in the new research we're about to do, um, you know, the, the, the amount of nicotine contained within the liquids has sub substantially dropped uh, from when we did our research. Uh, so I would expect even with the lower levels that we found um, in comparative analysis against a standard high nicotine cigarette, that those levels would be even lower now. So um, bringing me back to the point that uh, we can't definitively ever say that they are completely not um, not safe. However, that the minute that the, the level of risk uh, that we found originally actually is substantially lower um, in terms of adverse health effects when compared to an actual cigarette. Thank you for that, Dr. McCauley. Um, it, we, we all want to know that it's it's risk aversion. We want to stay away from risk as much as possible. That's right. Limit that exposure. Um, right. We're hearing an awful lot about reports about chemicals found in e-cigs, specifically formaldehyde. And mm -hmm. I was just curious that in any of your studies, have you encountered high level of formaldehyde in some of these e-liquids? We have not. Um, the, and again, part of the research that I've been involved in, I mean, a big question that sort of goes against a little bit about what with, with Greg was mentioning is that there's a lot of questions that um, need to look at not only just the liquids themselves, but what's going into them in terms of flavorings. Uh, you know, because we're part of the concern here as an aerosol scientist when you're dealing with public health is the fact that you're not always dealing with the primary constituent of that air toxin or air contaminant, but you're also dealing with the secondary byproducts that can be formed. Um, and so, in some of these cases, uh, when we mention about the toxins and things that are related on air contaminants, um, we're talking about, you know, regularly commercially available products that people can purchase um, and, and those kind of things. We're not talking about people in the basement making up, you know, different formulas and so forth. So I want to make sure that that point's clear uh, because it always does come up to say, well, what if I buy it off a friend? That's totally different. We're talking about people coming into a store or a vendor that has to sell, you know, certainly approved products. Um, so you have to sort of understand that with you know those different types of components, 
um, and things like that that, you know, we're not, we didn't see, uh, you know, typically high levels of formaldehyde, but we need to also understand more, which is an area of research that we're looking into, also to understand the, the organic, potentially inorganic, and other types of bottles or aldehydes or carbonyls that may exist um, in different concentrations in various types of liquids. Uh, because again, there isn't just one, one type of strawberry, one type of vanilla, one, there are thousands of different, uh, of different types. So it would take some, some good comparative studies to, to assess that, to be sure. Great. Um, thank you for that answer, Doctor. Um, now, you did some work with the American Heart Association. What was involved with that work, and what were the conclusions did you draw from that work? Yeah, the, I was part of a panel of experts uh, last year. Uh, there was, I think there was about 10 of us. Um, we were asked to put together a policy statement that essentially was published in Circulation, uh, which is a journal of the American Thoracic Society. Um, you can find it on Google. Um, and basically what it was, it was a, about a three-month panel. Uh, we met a couple times every couple weeks um, and really sort of evaluated what's the, st what's the status of the literature, uh, what do we know uh, from an international perspective, who's doing what, and we were really able to sort of sift through a lot of the research studies that people did that we just found weren't necessary, even though it was published, were they credible? I mean, do they actually have a, a good basis for their research? And so from the ones that were compiled that we found that were actually scientifically sound, um, we actually also had a couple policy analysts on the, on, the, um, on the committee. And the really idea was to evaluate sort of the, the public health aspects of the electronic cigarettes, the social aspects, the psychometric aspects, policy statements, um, you know, where's the replication between what we're seeing versus potential uh, inclusion into clean air, you know, into already smoke, you know, smoke-free laws set by the FDA for regular cigarettes. Where should all this go um, and where should we be? And, and overall, part of the conclusions that we found were essentially that um, we need to do more research. Uh, we need to get better. We need to get better answers uh, for the time being. Um, you know, it's the, it was the recommendation of the American Heart Association and that of the panel that electronic cigarettes, um, at least for the inclusion, uh, for, those un, for those areas that are not definitive, to just simply say, you know what, it's okay to put these under sort of these smoke-free laws. That doesn't include state, county, town bans. This is just in general, uh, with the caveat that as research becomes available um, and as we are doing more and more, that there's this caveat that we will be able to revisit this and that those laws can then be lifted. So this is not in stone, um, but that was the outcomes really of the panel and that there's again more investigative research that needs to go into teen addiction and you know, teen, you know, uh, teen social aspects and peer pressure on electronic cigarettes and um, sort of the whole uh, psychometric relations of you know, are electronic cigarettes used as gateway drugs or uh, gateway devices or does it keep people hooked on smoking versus so they just quit period and uh, despite the evidence that there has been reductions in, in lung cancer related to so all these things were sort of summarized and then our thoughts were kind of put together in the paper published. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's such a new product, it's such a new device on the market that they really need to take the time to get this research done and let well, all this be collected. Yes, that's, that's correct. And, and the hard part here is that you're sort of uh, you're sort of you're sort of working in a moving target. Uh, yeah. This is this is a very dynamic uh, industry. This is not static by any means. Um, and you know, as you start to begin doing research in one area, suddenly you start to notice that hey, there's a new tank on the market. There's you know three dozen new liquids that just came out, or there's all these things that as researchers uh, you need to start to have. You need to really get that thirty thousand foot view. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, there are other researchers out there, um, like Dr. Siegel and other colleagues of mine that are also looking at other pieces so that collectively, uh, although we may not be talking every day about what, who's doing what, but papers are getting published and people are able to find those and start to kind of put things together um, and that helps drive new research initiatives. Great. Thank you for that, Doctor. Now, we've all heard, uh, we may have heard reports about the National Park Service recently classifying electronic cigarettes as a tobacco product mm -hmm. and then banning them in all areas where smoking is prohibited. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on that legislation? Well, I mean, again, people are in general right now are going to default into what's already regulated. 
uh, because the amount of money that, for example, like the National Park Service or any federal agency, they are not going to spend the time and effort right now to go sort of against the, the regular policy aspects of what's in place. Uh, they're just going to kind of go with the flow because they can. Right. And, um, and so if you start to think about the amount of, and again, this is not a positive thing, uh, but if you are a federal agency and you're trying to mandate something, what's going to be easier for you? Stick it under something that already exists or actually say, you know, wait, no, no, no. Let's, let's start funding, you know, let's start putting out all this money and let's, let's stop and go. You're going to have to, you're just going to kind of take the easy way out. Um, and that was, again, going sort of coming back to the policy statement that was written. Um, you know, yes, it was part of the recommendation that we made. It wasn't that the panel was saying, you know, any federal agency, please, you know, put this under a smoke-free law. It's more of, look, you know, for the ease of not having to worry about battling over what should go where from individual components, now we can, now we, but we leave it open to the research to then dictate what laws should then be lifted um, and what regulations put in place. So. Great. Um, now, some have countered that by saying that burning charcoal contains far more harmful toxins than e-cigarettes do, and even cigarette smoke, and therefore they should also be prohibited in parks. They, um, yeah. And most yeah. of them are. I mean, you technically they are. I mean, you know, you can't go to a class one area at a national park and, and, and decide to have a charcoal fire. Right. Um, it's a protected. It's a protected region. Um, so there are specific areas inside parks that you are not allowed to do that. So. Um, you know, all these different sources are taken into account uh, for the protection of the environment and public health. Great. Well, I, we're going to move on to some questions from the attendees now. So we have a few rolling in here. Um, we have one question. People think about secondhand smoke and secondhand vapor as something that lingers in the air. But, uh, but what is the risk of res um, residual nicotine or chemicals left behind surfaces that vapor touches? Well, there's always, I mean, that's really the main component of what we call third part, you know, basically third, third party exposure where you get, uh, you know, you can get the deposition of a vapor on furniture, clothing, walls, and things like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is subject to concentrations, air changes per hour in the particular room or area that we're talking about, the volume of the room. Um, you know, if you have somebody coming into a room and, you know, they're standing there once a week for five minutes and vaping, um, you know, chances are, are you going to be able to go in there and really detect any kind of incident? Probably not. If it's somebody who's living there, um, and they're spending three or four hours there a night, we up and that kind of stuff, and they're vaping the entire time they're there, chances are that you will get, you will have the ability to actually detect through wipe samples and things like that or bulk analysis. Um, actual various chemicals that would be derived from the from the actual vapor themselves. Great, thank you for that, Dr. McCauley. Um, we got a couple, one more question here for you, and then we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, sure. So give me one moment to get that question up, and let's see what is it going to be. Okay, uh, Dr. McCauley, it seems that the um, most salient arguments we encountered are made without comparison of risk. And what can we look forward to in uh, scientific literature that directly demonstrates the risk to the end user and bystanders? Well, the end user is, I mean, that's, that's a separate, that's sort of a separate entity in a lot of the research that needs to be done. I mean, those are various inhalation toxicology studies, deposition modeling, the various things to actually look at the transport of the vapor and the constituents um, into the lung tissue, uh, coming from epithelial into the blood and things like that. I mean, there's a lot of things that take place on that. And those are typically much more of a controlled-based risk study uh, with, you know, a certain amount of, of known going in, how much is retained, how much is exhaled. Uh, you know, the, the general basis that we know from, uh, at least from the amount of the users, given that the vapor um, and the amount of water and things like that can actually be generated, also the function of relative humidity and temperature, we know the lungs have more humidity and things like that. Um, we expect a higher retention rate of the vapor um, of, than actually than what's actually exhaled. Um, so, when you're dealing with you know understanding the risk, part of it also goes to the bystander. Is that's that's a big data gap right now. Mm -hmm. um, that is an area of research that uh, is certainly a, a focal area. Uh, my overall risk perspective, again, depending on the bystander, is much, much lower than that of a comparison to an actual cigarette or the user. So we often can't, you know, it's, 
it's no different than, you know, basically trying to look at that, you know, look at the user. We know they're being exposed. We know their exposures and risks are higher. Uh, but as far as bystanders and people in other areas, it's really a function of environment, meaning where you are, what are you doing, um, and things like that. I mean, if you're standing in an urban center and, you know, heavy traffic at 7 a.m. in the morning and you're directly downwind of a major intersection, you're standing there, chances are somebody's standing next to you with an e-cig who's, you know, blowing it and it's coming to you versus what you're breathing in from the traffic is extremely negligible to what you're actually inhaling from all of the actual combustion products. So again, depends on where you are, what your environment is, and what your overall exposures are to other sources. Well, thank you for your time today, Dr. McCauley. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's a lot of informative information. Um, sure. We got some more questions rolling in, and we may, we may reach out to you via email to respond to some of those yep. questions. Anytime. And then at the end, we're also going to do another general Q&A. So if you have time, we'd invite yep. you to stick around for the remainder of the webinar. Certainly. No problem. Great. So our final speaker today is a professor in the Department of Community Health and Sciences at Boston University uh, School of Public Health. He also has been a researcher in the tobacco control area for the past 25 years. He writes a popular tobacco policy blog, The Rest of the Story, uh, where he provides commentary and insight onto current tobacco policy issues. Uh, Dr. Michael Siegel. Dr. Siegel, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for inviting me. Oh, we're glad to have you here, and thank you again for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. Um, so we got a few questions rolling in, so we're going to jump right into a couple of them here. Um, actually, uh, did you want to make a few statements before we started that? Well, I just wanted to very – I want to definitely leave most of the time for questions. I just – I do want to address two issues that I think are really critical. I want to make sure everyone understands. Um, and the first one is what exactly is, is uh, entailed in these new applications. So – According to the proposed FDA deeming regulations, every electronic cigarette product would have to submit a new application. Uh, and I want to talk just briefly about what's in that application, because as Greg Conley mentioned, um, it's very expensive to do these applications, and the fear is that it would literally put so many vaping uh, stores and, and smaller businesses out of, out of business. I just kind of want to explain why that is so people understand. The new application standard by statute, by law, is that you have to show that your product will be beneficial to the public's health. And that's the exact standard you have to show. And you have to show not only that it's beneficial for the users, but that it won't be harmful to non-users. So in other words, you have to not only show that the product is much safer than cigarettes, you also have to show that youth or other non-smokers are not going to start using the product. And as, doc, as Dr. McCauley explained, you know, the research is rather complex. It's not, it's not that easy to, to do this research. You have to have uh, large-scale studies, clinical trials to show the effectiveness of, of uh, the product in getting people to quit smoking. You have to uh, do large population studies to find out whether kids are progressing to smoking after experimenting with e-cigarettes. And so it's ex incredibly expensive and complex to do these studies. So the requirement for a new application is essentially a death sentence, I think, for, for, for I would say, most businesses that just aren't, uh, aren't trained, uh, aren't qualified, and don't have the resources to, to do this kind of thing. If you're a small vape shop owner, um, you know, how are you going to put this complex application together? And you may not even understand the research issues involved. So I, I think that, and I've been arguing for a long time, that this general approach that the FDA is taking makes, makes no sense. And what it, what it would do if these deeming regulations turn out to be the same as what they proposed is it would essentially hand the entire industry to uh, maybe 1% at the very top, the t mainly the tobacco companies, and maybe the largest of the independent electronic cigarette companies. Um, the second thing I just want to briefly touch upon is the way that the FDA is regulating the marketing and communications. What can e-cigarette companies say about their products? And unfortunately, it looks like the approach that the FDA is going to take has two major problems. The first is that they're not allowing any health claims to be made. Because if, if a health claim is made, the FDA is going to interpret that as meaning that the product is to be regulated as a drug rather than a tobacco product, which makes it almost impossible uh, to, to do. You have to a minimum of about eight years of clinical research to get it approved as a drug. 
Um, so you basically can't make health claims, which means that you can't tell customers the very basic truths about the product, that these products were intended to help smokers quit, that they were, that they are highly successful for many, many thousands of, of smokers to help them quit. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that you can't say. But to make the, the, the problem even worse, the FDA also looks like they're going to apply the, F, the modified risk regulations to these products. What that means is that you can't, you can't even tell customers that these are safer than cigarettes. You can't make a comparative claim uh, between these products and, and any other tobacco product. And to make things completely ridiculous, you can't even tell people that there's no tobacco in the product. Uh, because if you say that there's no tobacco, that's what's viewed as a reduced exposure claim, and that's not allowed without pre-approval. And the procedure to get approval is essentially impossible. Um, and so, you know, I think the the perhaps the worst part of the FDA, the proposed regulations at least, is that it would prohibit electronic cigarette companies from telling the truth to their to their customers about the two main benefits of this product. First that it can help you get off cigarettes, and second, that it doesn't contain tobacco and therefore is much, much safer. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Siegel. And, you know, in the customer service department here at White Cloud, we deal with that every day on a firsthand basis. So I appreciate you mentioning that. We have a few questions rolling in here. Um, in your recent blog, you discussed the anti-tobacco movement's treatment of e-cigarettes. And do you have any thoughts on why anti-tobacco groups are so negative about e-cigarettes? Well, this is a question that I've been thinking about actually for the past four years. Um, so I've had a lot of time to think about it. Um, and I, I finally have come up with, I, with what I think is um, the most logical answer. And I think what it has to do with is the fact that this is a movement that has, uh, is concerned about its prestige. And we didn't think of this. This is not an idea that we thought of. And I think that is a huge thing. I think that if this had come out of the tobacco control community, if, you know, for example, if Stan Glantz had come up with this idea of having a non-combustible alternative to, cig to cigarettes, that would be a lot safer. And he had been the first one to come up with the idea. I don't think that we'd be seeing the opposition we're seeing today. I think a lot of it is because this is not something we thought of, um, that this is something coming from outside industry uh, that in some cases involves tobacco companies to make it even worse. And so I think it's really a threat. I think these products are really a threat to anti-smoking groups because I think deep down they realize that this is, this is a game changer. I think subconsciously they recognize this is a game changer. This could completely transform the market. And that's scary to them because they can't claim that they were the ones who did it. They would have to say, you know what, we failed and these other, you know, uh, companies came in and they came up with a solution that none of us thought of. And that's why I think this is such a threat. And that's why I think they're ignoring or misrepresenting all of the research showing the benefits of these products and, and that they're demonizing them. Because I think that it may not be conscious, but I think subconsciously this is a real threat. And they're going to do everything they can to, to try to clear their, their, their uh, you know, keep their prestige and to clear their, their self-esteem. Uh, and I think that's really what's going on here. Well, Dr. Siegel, to expand on that a little bit more, what are the dangers of the continued negativity of these groups towards e-cigarettes? Well, I think there's two, two major uh, issues. And one of them has nothing to do with electronic cigarettes. It actually just has to do with smoking. Um, the groups claim that their goal here is to try to lower rates of smoking. And in fact, one of the main arguments they're using about e-cigarettes is that these products are going to get cause people, especially youth, to start smoking. But ironically, the danger of what they're doing is they're really undermining the public's appreciation of how bad cigarettes are. Because by comparing cigarettes to e-cigarettes and by basically saying, you know, e-cigarettes is, it's just as bad as e-cigarettes, um, or I'm sorry, that e-cigarettes are just as bad as, as real cigarettes, they're really undermining the, the public's appreciation of just how bad cigarette smoking is. And by failing to acknowledge that there's a major difference between a product that contains and combusts tobacco and a product that actually has no tobacco in it whatsoever and involves no combustion, it's completely distorting 
the public's appreciation of why cigarettes are so bad. They're bad for two reasons. One, because they involve burning, and two, because they involve tobacco. And if you take those two things away, you automatically are going to have a much safer product. And, and these groups are undermining that knowledge. And in the long run, I think it's actually going to lead to more people smoking. People are going to get scared. They're going to maybe, instead of trying to quit with e-cigarettes, they'll decide, you know, it's not worth it. If these things are almost as bad as, as cigarettes, why should I, why should I bother? Um, and the, the second thing that I think is, is harmful about the, these misrepresentations is that it, I think, is leading to policy that doesn't make sense. Um, I think that by putting out this misinformation, policymakers are really getting the wrong information, and they're using that wrong information uh, to make policy. And of course, the greatest example is the FDA and everything that we just talked about. Well, now, the American Lung Association in the upper Midwest recently said that smoking tobacco may be no more harmful than e-cigarettes. Um, how do you respond to that egregious claim? Well, I mean, I think that it's, um, you know, you respond to it by basically pointing it out and saying that this is just absolutely wrong, that this is, this is a lie, and I've done that repeatedly on my blog. What's frustrating to me is the fact that some of the mainstream organizations are saying things that just aren't true. I mean, we can go right to the top, and the CDC itself is basically stating that electronic cigarettes are a tobacco product. There is nowhere on the CDC site, and I've gone through it extensively, there is nowhere on their entire site where it actually acknowledges that e-cigarettes do not contain tobacco. If you did not know that, and you're a member of the public, and you're, or even a, a vapor or a potential vapor who's looking at their site for information, there is nowhere where they actually say it it's, uh, doesn't contain tobacco. And in fact, by classifying as a, as a tobacco product, I think they're misleading people into thinking that it does indeed uh, contain tobacco. So I think this problem goes all the way to the top. It's not just, you know, the, uh, a local group in the Midwest, uh, you know, some branch of the American Lung Association. This is really coming out of uh, national groups such as the CDC. And to me, that's what's so disturbing about it. And this is the nation's leading public health agency. And they're not even willing to acknowledge that electronic cigarettes don't have tobacco in them. Well, thank you for that explanation, Dr. Siegel. Um, regulations are designed to help keep the public safe and healthy, but at what point uh, do regulations begin to have the exact opposite of the intended effect and begin to do more harm than good? Well, I think that the, they begin to do more harm than good when they essentially violate science, the science. In other words, when policy is evidence-based, then I think it, it does protect the public's health. When policy loses that evidence base and when other factors such as politics or ideology start to influence the policy, that's when I think uh, that it really can have adverse effects. And I think that with e-cigarettes, that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, the FDA itself has, has stated that they're not sure that e-cigarettes are any safer. It, it's actually in the deeming, in the deeming regulation itself. It actually states that they're not sure that e-cigarettes are any safer than smoking. And so if you're starting from that, from that base where you basically are ignoring overwhelming evidence, uh, you're not going to come up with policies that, that, that actually protect the public health. And, and in this case, uh, the entire approach that the FDA is taking by requiring these new product applications, rather than simply setting safety standards for e-cigarettes, I think it's actually going to harm the public's health rather than protect it. Well, that's a great explanation there, Dr. Siegel. Um, we're going to open up to a general Q&A, so we're going to bring all of the panelists back in, open the mics up, and we're just going to fire out some questions from the attendees here, and whoever would like to chime in on these questions, please feel free to go in. Um, we have a first question here, and it's, it's about uh, a drug like Chantex was approved so easily, yet they cause harm to the user where e-cigarettes really haven't been seen to do that. Uh, would anybody like to comment on that, that discrepancy there? I'm not sure I understand the question. How do you justify Chantex getting approved yeah. so easily? How do you justify Chantex getting approved so easily and e-cigarettes having such a fight to get approved? Well, you want to go ahead, Dr. Siegel, before I... No, no, go ahead. You start. I'll... I'll, I'll no, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, with any, with any drug that's passed through, I mean, I'm not... I mean, I, I first of all, 
would be, you know, not I wouldn't say that wouldn't use the word easy. I mean, all drugs go through, you know, a very intense clinical trial period and um, things like and along those lines. Um, at least they're supposed to. Um, as far as, again, I think part as, as far as, you know, from the electronic cigarette industry, it goes back to the point of a very dynamic industry. Things are constantly changing. And so uh, how you're monitoring that and how you're trying to track that back is, is extremely difficult. And, um, you know, Chantix doesn't have several different types of derivatives and formulas and, and, and things. It's, it's drug. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of what we're facing here is you're looking at that's sort of a really a sort of an apple. It's not really an apple to apple comparison uh, versus, uh, you know, trying to identify, uh, you know, this, this understand, but Dr. Siegel, one of the, he's, he's right. And one of the biggest things that we, as people in the research field say is science has to drive policy here. Um, and this, a lot of what's, you know, going into drug development and so forth is science in, in terms of just, just looking at drug interactions and so forth. So in this field of e-cigs, it's a very difficult field. And so it, I think overall, the more evidence that we can put out there, um, you will start to get other. You will start to get people looking at it, and I've seen it now. I mean, I've seen people that I, I when I first started doing this research, who just literally were like, "Oh, this is a drug delivery device. This is just going to kill people." Who are actually like, you know, Tim, you guys, the research you guys are doing, and other people, like, this is actually very interesting, and it's kind of changed our mode of thinking. So, and these are high, highly known scientific experts. So, it's just a matter of time. So, great. Thank you for that, Dr. McCauley. Um, Dr. Siegel, did you have anything to add about that question? Yeah, just want just to add one thing to what Dr. McCauley said, and that's that I think it's important to recognize that uh, a lot of the side effects of Chantix in terms of these uh, these uh, psychological or psychiatric effects, such as suicidal ideation or suicide, weren't really ne recognized until the post-marketing uh, surveillance. In other words, after the drug was already approved. And so, and, and the same is true with a lot of drugs that have been taken off the market, like Vioxx is a great example where yeah. when, it, when it was approved, they didn't know about these side effects. So I don't think we can blame the FDA for approving in the first place. Um, the problem is that when you have these post-marketing uh, adverse effects that are found, the, because the drug is already on the market, yeah. the, the burden of proof is really on uh, – to, to, to lean towards keeping it on the market unless the side effects are so bad because the drug is already having benefits for, for people. Um, I think the interesting thing about electronic cigarettes is that in a way, um, you know, with most drugs, they're not, they're not put on the market until they're approved. But electronic cigarettes have basically been on the market for in the United States for at least eight years now. And so in a sense, we actually do have a post-marketing surveillance period that's taken place, and we haven't seen any major acute health effects from the product. I mean, if people were, were uh, you know, dying of pneumonia or pulmonary embolisms or heart attacks, you know, we, we would see these kind of major events happening uh, because we have some experience with millions of people using it for five, six, seven years. Right. Uh, so if anything, I think that experience uh, leads to a, a more optimistic assessment of where e-cigarettes are compared to where most drugs are at the time that they're approved. Yep. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Siegel. Uh, Mr. Connolly, would you like to add anything on that question before we move on? I think Dr. Siegel and Dr. McCauley covered it sufficiently. Great. Uh, well, we have another question here, and this one's directed actually at Dr. Siegel. Um, aside from the PHE study, can you point to two or three other leading studies that advocates can use um, in their work to educate policymakers on the best science behind e-cigs and vaping? Well, I think the most convincing study um, that's out there is the study that Dr. Ricardo Pelosa did, where he basically took asthmatic patients, patients, smokers with asthma, and he uh, gave them electronic cigarettes and some of them switched completely to electronic cigarettes others only partially uh, and then he, he monitored their lung function before and afterwards with with spirometry testing mm -hmm. and he also uh, asked them about respiratory symptoms and his findings were were pretty amazing what he found was that the both the subjective symptoms of the smokers and their um, I'm sorry, both the subjective symptoms of the smokers and the objective 
uh, evidence from the spirometry greatly improved after they switched to electronic cigarettes. Uh, and this was after only about a month period, so it was a very short-term effect. And the most interesting thing to me was that this improvement was seen not just in those who switched completely to e-cigarettes, but also in the dual users uh, who reduced the amount that they smoked by a large amount. Um, and so to me, this is the strongest evidence that you can use to convince policymakers because it's actually direct clinical evidence. How could smoking be as bad as electronic cigarettes if, if asthmatic smokers who switched to e-cigarettes had a dramatic improvement in, in their health? So I think that's the type of study that um, I think is, is being ignored by so many people, uh, so many of the opponents of electronic cigarettes. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Siegel. And um, after the webinar, we'd like to get a link to that study so we can send that around to all the participants as well. Um, we have another question here that's direct, uh, directed towards Mr. Connolly. Uh, what, if anything, can be done to move the public health community as a whole towards acceptance of tobacco harm reduction through the use of vapor products? I think that we need to look at a place where the approach has, has worked in, in large part, England where you have very passionate consumer vapors that, as well as uh, passionate members of industry, reaching out and trying to develop relationships, trying to lightly challenge them without being too harsh unless they, they're too far gone. Um, I got to sit down, I got to talk to a few people yesterday that um, are kind of in the middle on the e-cigarette issue, but they are very important voices. There are some that will never be reachable. The government relations people at the American Cancer, American Heart, uh, those people can't be reached. We People have tried. But there are opportunities, your lo local health departments, state health departments, attorney general's offices, um, those are great places to start. Great, thank you for that, Mr. Conley. Um, we got one more question here before we have to end the webinar. And this one just simply states, uh, is big tobacco scared? <laughs> is that why they're getting into e-cigarettes? And do they possibly see that this is the way of the future and they want to cash in on this? And this question is open to any of the panelists. Well, I, I, I'll, uh, I, I guess I'll start and, and just say that absolutely the answer is yes. I mean, the, the, the big tobacco companies, I think, unlike much of the public health community, understand that non-combustible tobacco products are going to be the wave of the future. Yep. Whether anti-smoking groups like it or not, this is where the future is, is going to go. And the tobacco companies want to be in the game. They realize that there's a limited shelf life for, for combustible tobacco products, uh, in the United States at least. And that as smoking rates continue to decline and decline, you know, smoking is at its lowest level historically among both adults and youth today, and it keeps going down drastically. So I think they realize that the the combustible market is declining, and they want to be in on the action uh, to to make sure that as the forms of nicotine delivery change, uh, that they're in the game. And unfortunately, it's kind of sad to me that. Ironically, the tobacco companies are the ones who want to play this game changing. Uh, they want to be in this game changer where the anti-smoking groups who you think would, would be the ones who would actually want to transform the entire market from a combustible market to a much safer alternative nicotine delivery market. You would think that they would be want to play ball with this, but they are absolutely, they're trying to stop the game. And it, to me, that's probably the greatest irony uh, in public health of, of my time. Yep. And I, I, I think a lot of that, just to add to that very point, is the fact, again, is that often people that are advocating against these have the least amount of information to be able to, to critically review and criticize um, in terms of a scientific aspect. So that's, that's part of what we're dealing with, as Greg sort of said earlier. You're dealing with so much information that's coming out that's just pure junk from people who aren't really qualified to be doing science. 
that's getting the ears and attention of those people that are able to actually, you know, that are publishing good research. So it's really just a matter of, um, you know, ensuring that good science is done by those that are doing it so that you have that evidence to then drive that policy forward rather than, I think you'll eventually see people fall off. Once you, know, once you put something peer reviewed in front of people, the science is, is backing up that policy, suddenly you'll start to notice a lot of mouths in the crowd shut uh, because you can't argue with it because that's the benefit of doing peer reviewed research, not white papers, not you know things just putting out in the general public, but research that is published in journals that's publicly accessed but has passed through a very critical piece of a process that has shown to say, you know what, this 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 work merits publication for that can be used. That's how the national ambient air quality standards for environment and public health are set. They're set off the research. Do, you, do they always get to the levels we might want them? Maybe not. But that's the idea behind it. The, the NACs were not set based off recommendations from advocacy people. They were set from researchers, people doing the work, looking at the health effects, looking at the impacts on the environment. And that's what we have to do here is to ultimately get enough research out there that's going to drive that policy home, and you will start to see everybody off just fall. Well, thank you for that, Dr. McCauley. Uh, yeah. We've had a lot of great content here in this webinar. Unfortunately, we're running short on time now. Uh, we also got a lot of questions that we didn't get a chance to get to during the webinar, and I just want to reassure everybody that we are going to respond to these questions via email. Um, in the next couple days, uh, we'll respond to those questions via email in the next few days. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panelists and all the attendees who came in today. And we just want to let everybody know that we're going to continue with this web series and that we hope everybody can join us again for the next one. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for attending. And I hope everyone has a great day.